and welcome to My Career in Data, a podcast where we discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers. I'm your host, Shannon Kemp, and today we're talking to Jeff Chow from Sync Computing. With a robust catalog of courses offered on demand and industry-leading live online sessions throughout the year, the Dataversity Training Center is your launchpad for career success. Browse the complete catalog at training.dataversity.net and use code DVTALKS for 20% off your purchase. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Dataversity. And this is My Career in Data, a Dataversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management, to understand how they got there and to talk with people who help make those careers a little bit easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Today, we're joined by Jeff Chow, the CEO of at Sync Computing. And normally, this is where a podcast host would read a short bio of the guest, but in this podcast, your bio is what we're here to talk about. Jeff, hello and welcome. Hello. Hi, Shannon. Great to meet you. I'm really excited to be here. Likewise. I'm so excited to meet you as well. It's one of my favorite things about this podcast is meeting new people. Uh, it's, been, it's been a great um, bonus of this podcast. Um so tell me, okay, so you're the CEO at Sync Computing. So tell me, what type of business is Sync Computing? So we are in the, we're automating Databricks cluster management is mm -hmm. kind of the very short summary of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And with the goal of, we basically help enterprises make their Databricks clusters cheaper, faster, and can help them hit their SLAs for all of their kind of data processing needs. Um, that's kind of where we're at today. Happy to get into our history and origin. I'm also the the co-founder uh, of the company, so there's a there's a lots of origin story stuff as well. That's that's where we want to go. Yeah, well, I definitely want to hear about how and why you co-founded this company. But um, but let me and we'll get into that for sure. Um, because that's super, I, I love it when when we get to talk to founders because it's such a scary thing, right? To <laughs> take this Very step scary. and <laughs> and it's such an admirable thing. I'm, I'm scared every day. That's very true. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, tell me as a CEO and co-founder, what does your typical week look like? Um, that's a good question. There are probably like three big buckets that I'm probably any CEO is part of. The biggest one probably is customers, both in like finding them, um, how do we, you know, how do we move them through the system? And then obviously how do we um, make money with our customers? Two is more the internal management, just making sure all the teams are coordinated and moving, is information flowing, are there any blockers? And then three is more like kind of external slash roadmap. This is where I talk to like the board, investors. Um, this is a little bit more longer thinking. There's, there has to be one person in the company who's thinking like, six, 12, 18 months out, you know, what are we doing? Are we on the right path? Are we going in the right direction? Um, those are like the main three big buckets. And so then in any typical week, I am having, usually my, my days are just meetings. I'm just sitting on Zoom all day, but I'm doing one of those three, either like pitching to a new customer, having a one-on-one -on -one with an internal team member um, or talking to a board member or an investor and then kind of like triangulating, okay, is everything kind of, moving in the right direction. Yeah, I, I imagine you use a lot of data to uh, facilitate those decisions. Yeah, we try to use data. I think in any startup though, you're sometimes you have to kind of make a decision when you have like 60, 70% of the information, right? You right. never really have all of the information. Yeah. Um, Cause you're trying to move fast. You're like, all right, I think right. we have enough intel. We have enough intel, let's, let's make a decision. Yeah, yeah, I can I can understand that and relate. <laughs> so, yep. so yep. tell me, um, is this what you wanted to be when you grew up? So, say you're six years old. You know, was this the dream? Uh -huh. I'm going to be a co-founder of of Sync Computing. Um, my background is is so I, I was a researcher, so I was I got like my my PhD, and that's kind of the genesis of the company. So I think when I was young. I always like science and technology. Um, so I always kind of went into research. But as I got older and in college, I actually had a second life where I did a lot of comedy stuff. So oh. I did a lot of I did a lot of improv comedy. So there was a time where I was like 
do I want to do comedy or do I want to do technology? And uh, comedy yeah. is a that, that's a tough life. So I kept doing it, it as a hobby. Um, but um, so I, I always knew I liked technology and computers. Um, I didn't know I would be on the business side. That's probably unexpected. You know, business selling mm -hmm. sales. Yeah pitching to investors that's that wasn't something I really envisioned that I would ever do yeah so um so you, you're you love tech and so as you get into high school and on to college so what was your interest in as you went in that direction what was your original so I was a electrical engineering and computer science major mm -hmm. um, in undergrad Mm -hmm. um, I went to UC Berkeley for undergrad and then I, mm -hmm. I stayed there for grad school. So I was there for like 10 years. So a little, yeah. a little too long, I think. <laughs> um, so I was always kind of in, interested in really at the intersection between software and hardware. I thought mm -hmm. that was kind of getting low level code and then understanding, well, how does like, how does the transistor actually make it all happen? Um, that was mm -hmm. always kind of fascinating to me. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, and then how did the uh, comedy come about? Was it just something that you have always been interested in and just decided, you know, I'm going to explore that? Um, it started, I think, in high school. I, I like, hosted um, a show, and it was, like, we were just doing sketches, and I was like, oh, this is tons of fun. And so in college, you know, in any college campus, there are always comedy sketch groups, so I joined, um, you know, the main one on, on, on campus, and it was just yeah. a ton of fun. Uh, and so oh, nice. um, it was always you know my side thing <laughs> that yeah, was like yeah. just something I like to do that I I really enjoyed I knew there wasn't really a career or a job there but it was just tons of fun and the friends were always always great well I will say you're not the first to uh dip their toe into the comedic world that I've <laughs> interviewed <laughs> oh nice nice yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, so Okay, so then where did you go from there? So, you know, you, you say you, um, so after your your bachelor, so then what did you continue, pursue your uh, degrees in? So then I, I stayed at Berkeley for a PhD and I was on the electrical engineering side. So I kind of built hardware, was that, or not built, it was like research. Um, mm -hmm. My first project was for Hewlett Packard, HP, and one of their data centers. So I was doing research on like advanced communication in kind of their large data centers. Um, that's cool. Yeah. So that, that's kind of where my, I started getting more and more into like large scale computing. That's kind of where, where my career went. Fun. Uh, so that certainly, you know, naturally leads into where you are now. So after you get your PhD, so what's your, what's your first, job then you know after <laughs> that real job yeah that's <laughs> yeah true. yeah grad, grad school is not a real job that's for sure um <laughs> I actually had a very interesting little break I, I wanted a little break from I guess research and technology and so I I went to New York City and I joined a patent law firm and I was like a uh what's the title like technical patent agent something like that so it helped mm -hmm. patent lawyers like look at kind of big patents from all the big tech companies um, oh. I did that for about like, I uh, forget, almost a little less than a year, I think. Uh -huh. And then I kind of went, I went back to technology after that, but it was a nice little break yeah. um, to just try something totally new. Oh, that must've been interesting. What, uh, reviewing cool new things. Yeah, it was interesting to read patents. I, I learned a lot about the legal world of patents. I think oh, yeah. They're both the good and the bad. It's interesting. Yeah. It's not, it's not a as altruistic as I maybe thought it was because there's a lot mm -hmm. of, I mean, it's just a lot of legal, it's about money and you know, it's a, it's a money-making system. And so yeah. um, you, I saw kind of like the whole thing. I was like, Oh, all right. Mm -hmm. I kind of want to go back to technology. Um, so yeah. I, after that, I went to, uh, I went, I went to MIT for a postdoc actually. So I went kind of back to academic roots. Um, nice. And from there I went to MIT Lincoln lab and that's where I did the research that started sync computing um, with my co-founder okay so so tell me about that and very cool um so tell me about your time there at mit and, and how that progressed and what made you decide to start sync computing um yeah so when i was my postdoc at, at mit was actually more in the materials and optics so i kind of drifted into like the energy space 
Um, mm-hmm. But it was still optics and optical communication type, type work. And then when I went mm-hmm. to Lincoln Lab, Lincoln Lab, by the way, is like the government research arm of MIT. Um, so it's like a large research facility about half an hour away mm-hmm. from campus. And when I was at Lincoln Lab, they have these like exploratory research projects you can kind of pitch. And one of them was an advanced computing concept, Mm -hmm. Um, basically kind of a new chip architecture to solve a certain class of optimization problems. And so that was the genesis. Um, The roots of basically sync computing was that research work. We published a paper and we got funded um, by MIT's venture arm, essentially. That's kind of how it all got started. Wow, that's amazing. How exciting. And how cool. Yeah, yeah, it was a wild ride. Um, this was in like 2019 when the venture world was flush with cash. Um, yeah. I think COVID was just about taking off, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. But the VC markets were just, it was a lot easier to fundraise back then than it is these days. Um, sure. We, were, we, got, we got lucky with the timing. Sure, sure. So what really went into like, I, I want to do this on my own, I'm going to get some funding and and I am going to start this company. And what was the need that you were seeing from for um, customers and um, who was your target customer? That's a really great question. I think, um, well, to answer your first question, like, why did we want to jump out? I think we saw this as a really unique opportunity First of all, the funding from the VC world was so much larger than if we just kept, we could have kept on doing it inside a government research arm, but the funding was literally like one tenth of the value. And so we're like, wow, we could do a lot more with VC money than we could do with kind of internal R&D funds. Mm-hmm. That was a big one. And I've also, I've always kind of been, you know, startup curious. I'm sure a lot of folks probably listening to this podcast are like, oh, startups sound like a lot of fun. <laughs> now that I've been in it for a little while, I can say it's it most days it's pretty rough um it's really it's a lot of hard work um mm-hmm. but anyways i've always had that itch that entrepreneurial itch i was at, yeah. i've always been kind of considered very very been very curious about that versus kind of working at a giant company which i was working with government which is one of the obviously one of the largest right. entities out there um so working at a startup was always very kind of exciting to me yeah. And then who's your, who, so as you form the company, you know, who, who is your, is your target customer? Oh yeah, that's right. So we had a very kind of windy path. Originally we, we were actually going to be a hardware company mm-hmm. um, trying to solve a certain class of optimization problems. So we were going after large enterprises, like large pharmaceutical companies, logistics companies, shipping companies like UPS, Mm-hmm. trying to see like oh are they like bottlenecked by an algorithm are they like you know for example ups trucks um are they unable to solve the like optimal routing problem like oh every truck you know they have thousands of trucks mm-hmm. tens of thousands of packages every hour probably do they know exactly where every truck should go everywhere um and so that was we were kind of going after those customers You're like do you need help accelerating solving these routing problems these optimization problems faster that's kind of where we where we started nice nice and you said it's evolved yeah it evolved quite a bit um, so we started there we ran into some challenges we found out that they weren't really um mathematically bottlenecked you know for example we talked to ups and they published papers about this. It's all public, but they they actually do have an algorithm that does route all of their trucks. Mm-hmm. And they solve all of the routes for all of their trucks across the United States in like two minutes. Wow. And it's an amazing piece of work. And we talked when we talked to the person who created it, yeah. he said it took about like a year to develop the algorithm and then about nine years to um convince everyone else because you have to put in a lot of sensors and tracking and you have to train the drivers and then you need like a robust system because you know if one person oversleeps does that like break your whole schedule Um, and so there was just the the, i think the reality of bringing an algorithm like that was really the hard part and the math was actually wasn't so crazy um so because of that we had to like find a new problem like all right well what's a problem that doesn't have people involved um that you know if you just solve it and, and solve the optimization you instantly unlock value for a company and mm-hmm. we kind of obviously our roots uh, were in computing and so really like, well large-scale computing 
is a mess and there's inherently an optimization problem there, which is like resource allocation, you know, like how much memory should you use, how much network storage, mm -hmm. how much compute, where should tasks go on which machine. Um, and so we really like that space and we found out, oh, okay, you can actually map that to a mathematical problem and then solve that. If you solve that, then you make all of your like big data jobs, for example, run a lot faster. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that, that's kind of how we. Does that make sense? That's kind of how we yeah. evolved, yeah. like large scale, and how we eventually got into the data world. Because um, obviously the market is huge. You know, there's yeah. lots of big data stuff runs on lots of large clusters, and so that's like a multi billion dollar market. So that's kind of how we kind of got pulled into the data world, kind of from the outside. Yeah. So yeah, like uh, so yeah, just not a, ever a linear path, right? But it all comes no. down to the to the data. Um, I, I love that story, uh, and, and I love how you just kind of keep on learning and keep on growing, and and uh, throughout uh, your school even and into your career. More and more companies are considering investing in data literacy education, but still have questions about its value, purpose, and how to get the ball rolling. Introducing the newest monthly webinar series from Dataversity, Elevating Enterprise Data Literacy, where we discuss the landscape of data literacy and answer your burning questions. Learn more about this new series and register for free at dataversity.net. So, um... So what's been your biggest lesson so far in your career as you as you go through these challenges? That's a really good question. Um, certainly over the past couple of years, as I've been kind of part of Sync, I've probably learned the most over the past, my years here at Sync than I have at, at any other point. <laughs> so if anyone wants to just, you know, drown in lessons learned, you know, I recommend start a company because you will learn a ridiculous amount about yourself, um, about how business works and startups work. Um, I don't know if I could pick one, I mean, literally hundreds of lessons, but maybe two I would circle that were maybe surprising to me. One was to trust your gut. Um, mm. And, you know, I think when I first started Sync, you know, especially I'm, I'm a first time founder and, you don't, it's not like I have tons of experience. I knew exactly how a company should run X, Y, Z. This is how this should work. That's how that should work. Um, and so you're, you often kind of doubt yourself. And this might be good life advice. You're always like, I don't know if I'm right or if I'm wrong. You know, you might be like, this doesn't feel right. But then you kind of doubt yourself. Like, well, I, maybe I just don't know what I'm talking about or I don't understand. Um, and so maybe you get some external advice and you follow that advice and then it turns out, oh, maybe you feel like I don't really understand that advice, but that I trust that person, right? I guess I'll do, I'll try that. And then it turns out actually that's not right. Um, and so I think from a life advice, like if it doesn't feel right to you, if it's just like, oh, this, is, this isn't right, this doesn't make any sense to me, I don't, I don't agree with this. Maybe I, I don't really know why, but it's not, it just doesn't, the inputs and outputs aren't, aren't making any sense to me. Probably you should, you know, you should listen to your internal voice. Like, okay, I gotta, I gotta stop this. Or like this, even a, even a really fancy person with a lot of experience or coming from a big company or a big university, you shouldn't even follow them. Like only, you know, kind of what you're seeing. Um, and so you should, you should really put more weight into yourself. It's kind of a big lesson that I learned. Um, and probably the other, the second big lesson is like, this is more like perhaps CEO company perspective is that within a company alignment is really, really critical. And this was maybe something I didn't put enough weight into in the beginning where, mm -hmm. especially in an early stage startup, we were just trying to figure out what's going on. Like everyone right. has to be aligned on mm -hmm. what's going on. And you can't just kind of, half acid it has to be really like okay seriously like we are doing this goal yeah does everyone agree are we all on the same page and like it's not so it's not like you have one meeting and everyone gives a thumbs up and you're, okay good we're all aligned it, it is a grind it is a continuous pressure of like are we aligned next week are we aligned next week? right you know in any small like well i kind of see that but i want to do this instead of that and you're like, all right wait, wait let's let's zoom in on that <laughs> and so i think that alignment especially in the leadership team 
well, this whole company in general, that alignment is really critical. Um, so maybe some advice for folks listening, like if you're a new person at a company, you know, talk to your manager, your boss, and really understand like what are you, what do you want your stakeholders? Like, are we aligned? Like, yeah. you want like customers to be happy? Are we trying to make the CEO happy? Is this just an, like an internal thing? Like, what's going? Like, who is happy with what? What is the goal? What is the output? Um, so I'm kind of rambling, but those are kind of like maybe two big lessons that I learned. Those are great lessons. And, and again, I can certainly empathize with the uh, the latter, you know, being this, you know, smaller company ourselves. You know, I, we talk about Tony, this our founder and CEO. You know, I, when I we first started, I talked about, I wish I could just, you know, plug in a net cable into his brain and download. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, That's you know, right. we've learned, you know, it's that communication and, you know, and we talk about now how there's no air between us because there's just a lot of communication. So we're always on the same yes, page. Yeah, we work you need hard. Really yeah. yeah, we work hard at it to be on the same page. Yeah, very yes. intentional. Yeah, it's not just, yeah, it's not like once a year. Right, yeah. <laughs> you know, is this good? All right, good, we're done. It is, <laughs> right. it is yeah. constant work to be like, are we aligned? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are we on the same page, right? Yeah, communication so is like constant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was Absolutely. something I kind of underestimated, yeah. Yeah, I, I went to you, man. Yeah. Um, well, th that's amazing. So, um, so now that you know you've you've dipped your toe into data and it's become you know a major component of your company, do you have what's your definition of data? That's a very good question. Um, probably the simplest definition is I don't know if it's too profound, but it's it's information. Right? It's um, at the end of the day. That's probably pretty obvious, um, but it's information and it's all about what are you trying to do with that information? And, you know, in the, in the data world, it's like, I'm trying to create a dashboard so that some executive can see what's going on with the sales team. Um, in AI and generative AI, you're like trying to predict or generate text. In an ML model, you're trying to predict the recommendation for your retail system. Um, but to do any of that, you need the information to base your algorithm or your output off of. And so um, I think that's the simplest definition that I can think of. It's, it's just, it's just information. Yeah, yeah, no, it's great. It's perfect. Um, and, and you, uh, you mentioned AI and machine learning, which, you know, it's hard to uh, have a conversation in the data world without those, without AI yeah, coming up right. <laughs> anymore. Right. right. But right. um uh, so, uh, and you talk about managing the data and I, I just, we're finding too, that, uh, what we're doing has becoming far more important because as people try and stand up AI, uh, initiatives, you know, they're learning that they miss the data management or piece of it. And, uh, yeah. you know, the, the adage of garbage in garbage out, Yes. right. Yes. <laughs> So are you finding that as well, you know, helping customers to make sure that the quality going into their algorithm, the, the data going into AI is is quality and managed and comes from a reliable I think we source. actually, we actually, use, so we have a machine learning algorithm that we use that we built in-house mm -hmm. internally. So we're consumers of, kind of AI ML mm -hmm. algorithm world. Mm -hmm. uh, what we do for customers, what we help them with is basically optimize their compute infrastructure. So we actually, for customers, we don't actually, I, they, we don't actually look at their data. So we're not kind of in mm -hmm. the data quality world. We just help them yeah. optimize the compute. But yeah. internally us, like yeah. we are a data company because um, as you said, that very famous phrase, garbage in, garbage out is a bajillion percent correct. And right. that we had to take a lot of lessons learned as we were developing our system because mm -hmm. it's not always black and white. Well, what's garbage and what's not garbage, <laughs> you know, maybe it, it's like, maybe this is good data. Then you run it and you try and go, Oh no, that's not good enough. We need more. Then you try this. You go, oh, that's not good enough. We need more. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's easy to say garbage and garbage out, but in reality, especially when you're a small startup and you're trying to be scrappy and efficient, you don't want to over design or over engineer. Um, so it's not it's not always trivial to kind of get to that to understand what is garbage and what is not. Um, yeah, 
Fascinating. I love it. Well, so do you see the importance of data management and the number of jobs working with data? I mean, even from the adjacent position that you're in, you know, increasing or decreasing over the next 10 years and why? Yeah, I definitely, uh, I think the answer is obviously definitely growing. Um, data, you know, memory capacity has only skyrocketed over the past several decades. I don't think data is ever going to go and get smaller across the world, right? Just the right. growing population itself <laughs> is maybe the fundamental driver. So why data will never get smaller. Um, and I think obviously with generative AI and all of that, the, the crazy hype that's there, that consumes an enormous amount of data. And so I, yeah, I think that it's a very, very safe bet that data has only become bigger and more important. How do you process it? How do you move it? How do you compute? What algorithm are you building? What's your purpose? I think that's probably what's most exciting is what are you going to do with the data? You know, generative AI is just one application. Um, and now there's like, I know there's like crazy new robots that are combining generative AI with robotics now. So that's really cool. So like, what are you going to do with the data? Um, so I think, you know, human creativity won't stop. Technology won't stop. It's only just going to grow more and more and more stuff. But the fundamental thing that'll never change is you need data to do anything intelligent. Um, yeah. So I think I am very comfortable saying it's, it's only need bigger, more jobs, more data, more memory, more storage. If that's never going to shrink. Are you with quantum computing? I'm sorry. How do I feel about quantum computing? Uh, yeah. Where are we with quantum computing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. You know, I, I so I actually have uh, some of my research roots were in quantum computing, so I, I know a bit about that world. Um, quantum computing is interesting. Um, it's still very researchy. Um, so while theoretically it is very powerful, I think it's still like probably decades away before it's like practically useful. Um, yeah. Like right now, your laptop can outperform all of the quantum computers out there today. And probably for many decades, that will be true. Um, so I, I don't think the industry is going to be threatened by quantum computing anytime soon. Um, it's still very much so like a laboratory R&D thing. Um, I think probably hardware-wise, as we're seeing with NVIDIA, they're going crazy. Um, mm -hmm. I think OpenAI is trying to, they're like trying to do hardware now too. Oh, really? Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think from a hardware perspective, I think NVIDIA, OpenAI, um, OpenAI has a very unique perspective because they, they know the algorithm and it's their secret sauce. And so they know exactly what the hardware um, challenges are. And so I'm actually very excited to see what they do and what they output because they have a unique advantage mm -hmm. and they even have something NVIDIA doesn't have, which is like the, their core algorithm. Um, so that'll be really cool to see over the next like five, 10 years. If that's true, if they do create hardware, that'll be really cool. Yeah. Just add to the fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's only going to, it's only get crazier. It's a really exciting time in computing to see kind of where, where stuff goes. Yeah. Indeed. So then what advice would you give to people looking get, to get into a career in data management? Um, that's a really good question. So we actually do work with a lot of kind of data managers at mm -hmm. kind of large enterprises. Um, and so we've seen some of their pain points. Um, and I think, you know, a couple of pieces of advice, one that kind of, one that I kind of mentioned earlier was like, you know, what is the business objective, right? You're at a company doing a thing. You really got to know what exactly is important. You're not just building random dashboards and building pipelines for no reason. Like it serves a business purpose. So definitely fundamentally, you got to understand like what, why are you building it before you touch any code? Just like, why are we doing this thing? What do you care about? What is the metric of success? Um, number two, I would say one of the things we see with data managers, like platform managers, is that there is a segregation between in any company, there's usually like a platform manager. And then below that person, like a team of data engineers. And so the data engineers are the ones who are actually writing the code. And then you have platform managers who are kind of like overseeing everything, making sure they're using Databricks or Snowflake well, et cetera. Um, 
And what we see is like a division of labor, like data engineers are doing the coding and the platform managers are, are managing everything. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's hard for the platform managers to kind of make things better, to change anything because they have to go bug a data engineer and be like, hey, can we, can we change this thing? Can we do this thing? And maybe the data engineer is really busy. They're trying to get code. Um, they have a different set of priorities versus a platform manager perhaps is being kind of yelled at by the CTO saying, hey, your costs are too high or we need this to go faster or we need uh, some other goal. And the data engineer is being yelled at by their boss saying, hey, where's my code? Where's the output? And so I think one of the challenges of data management at at any enterprise are just competing priorities. Mm -hmm. Everyone at different layers of the cake have different Mm -hmm. priorities. And we've seen it firsthand. It's just hard to get things done because... What I care about is very different than what you care about. Even though someone's yelling at me and I'm like, okay, I can't do anything unless I have another person help me. So I, I think maybe one thing that's interesting is like the, I don't know if it's politics, but the amount of like coordination between other humans that's needed. You know, it's not just living in Databricks and then you're done. It's a lot of like, okay, I got to check person A. I got to get security involved. I got to get DevOps involved. Like, there's just yeah. so many bodies that you need. Um, so I would say be nice to people because you're, <laughs> that's one good advice because you're, it is not a solo job. You're more of a people coordinator and get things done. Well, that is so true. And I was, I was just having a conversation with someone earlier uh, about that today, actually. Um, so that, that communication, again, is just so key uh, yeah. and lots of communication. Uh, do you, you know, I have to ask, uh, do, you, do you find that your uh, comedic skills coming to play i mean seriously because you know it takes a lot to get up on stage right and put yourself out there in front of people does that help in your communication and does it help um do you you leverage that at all i think it it actually has probably one of the biggest advantages of me personally is is i did it for like 10 15 years so um, so like me Getting up on stage talking, I have like zero apprehension. I'm actually pretty yeah. comfortable on stage, so I enjoy it quite a bit. Um, public speaking, you also learn because in I did a lot of improv comedy, which is like improvised sketches, and so you have to learn how to read people as you're talking. And so I think you gain a lot of emotional intelligence trying to like say, like, "Oh, you, you you can really read body language really well." Like, "Ooh, that person didn't like what I said." <laughs> Um, maybe it helps a lot in when you have like group team meetings, one-on-ones, or even when you're pitching investors, you kind of have to like be able to read the room. Just, and that, that's a lot of it, like 90% of it's nonverbal communication. You just say, Ooh, all right. That person does not like me. <laughs> I need to see what's going on with that. Um, yeah. So I think I'm very thankful for the time that I was doing a lot of that stuff. And I think if I didn't do that and I was just like pure tech and I was just like in a basement coding. I probably would have none of that skill set. <laughs> probably sync would not exist because um, that helps a lot, especially in fundraising. It's all about like convincing sure. people, you know, pitching, believing what you're saying. Um, yeah. And I think my comedy background really, or performance background kind of helped out a lot then. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, that's awesome. And that's, that's so amazing. And, you know, it just goes to show that if you follow your passions, you can tie it all together, right? It doesn't have to be one thing or the other, and it doesn't have to be separate at all leverages. Uh, oh yeah. Builds on each I think, other. I think uh, a diversity of life experience is really, really important, right? Don't just be one dimensional. If you are, if you like painting, go, you know, get into it, you know, don't just, you know, get as aggressive as you can. If you like, I don't know, any hobby, you know, yeah. like actually do it. Maybe you, can you make a living off of it? That, that's really hard. That's like 0.001% can make a living off of like any, especially like creative arts hobby. Right. Um, but I would definitely encourage people, even, you know, I read a lot of resumes when we were hiring. I think it is very, it, it says a lot when you have like another hobby. I'm like, okay, this person like kind of is more multidimensional um, perhaps can think a little bit deeper, a little bit more differently because they understand in a completely different field. And so it, it helps kind of color um, people and personalities. Uh, it helps your resume stand out too. Like, oh, wow, this person is like an international skydiver. This is, that's crazy. <laughs> 
Um, it kind of helps a lot. So I definitely believe in definitely diversity in your life experience. You know, life's too short. Don't just code right. all day. Go do, yeah. follow your passions, right? You just gotta, you yeah. gotta do what you gotta do. Uh, well, Jeff, this has been such a pleasure. Um, you know, so, and I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, you know, if people wanted to find out more about Sync Computing, how would they find you? Um, yeah, you can check us out at uh, www.syncomputing.com. There are two C's in the middle there. Um, quick plug. So yeah, we do help enterprises and companies kind of optimize their Databricks clusters, lower costs. So if there are any listeners out there who are like, oh, I would love a system that can automatically make things all more efficient. Please check us out. Happy to jump on a call. Uh, or you can find me on LinkedIn as well. Uh, yeah, happy to chat with anyone. Oh, I love it. And we'll be sure to add those links to the podcast page as well. So people can find you and check you out. Cool. That sounds great. Awesome. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Cool. No problem. Thank you, Shannon. This is a lot of fun. Indeed. And for all of our listeners out there, if you'd like to keep up on the up to date and the latest in podcasts and in the latest in data management education, you can go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Until next time, stay curious, everyone. Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks, a podcast brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational webinars at dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Thank you.